All right, so this is the first hour of Physics 1B for Monday, October 4th. Today we're going to be uh, doing one quick calorimetry problem just to kind of refresh your, your minds about it since we, you know, it's been five days since we met and, you know, have had time to go home and do homework problems and stuff, so maybe this will be helpful to you review. And then we're going to talk about methods of heat transfer. The three main methods that we're going to talk about are conduction, convection, radiation. Probably some of you have probably heard of these topics before. Uh, so we'll just kind of solidify what they mean in this class and, and you know, how we're going to do some calculations involving heat transfer. Uh, you also have an exam on Wednesday night. If you're here from my other class, your exam is tonight at, at 6.30 p.m. So, um, yep, we got an exam, and I think we talked a little bit about it last week, but uh, it covers, um, it's just two chapters, right? Fluid dynamics and uh, this chapter that involves like, you know, calorimetry and, oh, sorry, it's, it's two chapters, but it's like fluid statics, fluid dynamics, and then it's also stuff like calorimetry and what was the other stuff from the last topic? To remind myself what we were doing last time. Uh, calorimetry, phase changes, um, specific heat, um, which is part of calorimetry. Uh, and then, oh, linked exp linear expansion, volume expansion, thermal expansion, thank you. That's right, Richard, exactly. So those are the only topics, um, which means that uh, you don't have much to study, you know, at all. Just make sure you show up on Wednesday at 9.45 a.m. You don't need to bring anything other than, you know, a pencil, uh, a calculator. That's pretty much it. That's all you need to bring. I'll give you anything else you need. Um, I'll provide you with, like, you know, if you could bring it. I guess you could bring a ruler if you really want to. But I'll, I can provide you with rulers if you need one. So, uh, any general questions about the test so we can get that out of the way before we get started here? Some people ask some questions before class, but just want to make sure. Yep, you'll get, a, you'll get a formula sheet. No, you can't make formula sheets. I'll give you one. I'll give you a formula sheet. There's really not that many formulas for the test in this particular case, as it turns out. Um, I mean, you should memorize those things, yes. You should memorize water density and water specific heat. But if for some reason there's a piece of information like that during the exam that you don't know, at least for this first test, I'll, 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 let, I'll let it slide and I'll write it on the board, okay? But um, yeah, I mean, water density is a thousand. That's pretty easy to remember. And specific heat of water, 4190, also pretty easy to remember, I think, because you end up using it a lot. I think you should memorize everything, you know? I don't know if I've talked to this class about this, but I think that we've all done you a horrible disservice by, by providing you with equation sheets. Like, I don't know when it started. I remember, I don't know, who knows when it started, but uh, I know when I took the AP exam in high, in high school, I was really shocked that they gave us an equation sheet. And the equation sheet was intense. I mean, it had everything. It had so much stuff that I felt like you almost didn't need to be very good at physics to, to solve the problems because there was so much information on this equation sheet. And, um, I found that to be really shocking. Anyway, it's the standard now. We always provide formula sheets and stuff like that, but I think it's doing you a disservice because it's kind of teaching you that memorizing things isn't necessary, and that just flat out isn't true. Um, memorizing formulas can be extremely helpful to solving things quickly. And one of the things that's gonna happen as you go from El Camino to a four-year school, which I know a lot of you are in the process probably of transferring this semester or in the future semester, right? Um, one of the big changes is when you're at a four-year school, you're going to be taking exams that are probably similar in length to the, to the exams you have at El Camino, but you're gonna have one third the time. You know, you're gonna have like 55 minutes to solve the exam. And that can be very shocking to people. And on those exams, you'll probably get equation sheets, most likely, right? But they're not gonna do you much good because any time you spend like looking at the equation sheet is time that you could have been solving problems, if that makes any sense. Does that make any sense? So if you don't need the equation sheet and it's just in your brain and you could just like, you know, write it down, um, you'll always be faster. And even in a three hour exam, like we have on Wednesday, being just a little bit faster with how you solve things can make all the difference in your grade, you know? And maybe it only increases your grade by like 5% or something because you have that extra time at the end of the test to go back and check your work, right? and you find an error or something like that, or you're looking at an equation, the equation just looks weird to you. You're like, I, maybe, I, maybe I've left something out. Things like that go a long way to, to helping you improve your grade by little little bits and pieces. Um, 
So just something to keep in mind, like, I think you should memorize all the equations. All the important ones, at least. You don't need to memorize all the little specific equations, but the big equations, like Bernoulli's principle. You should have Bernoulli's principle memorized, you know? Variation of pressure with depth, which is kind of like a special case of Bernoulli's principle, is another one you should have memorized. But if you only memorize Bernoulli's principle, then you pretty much already memorized variation of pressure with depth. Um, and then what else is there? Definition of buoyancy, that one's not hard to, to remember. It's just the weight of the water displaced, right? So it's rho vg, rho vg, it's pretty easy. That's pretty much it. You got your, the linear expansion ones, but I don't know. Especially for this test, I would highly recommend just going through and memorizing all those equations. It's not that many. Do you all agree? Do you all think I'm crazy? Do you think I'm tyrannical? That I think you should all be memorizing equations or do you, do you hear some truth in what I'm saying? I don't know. Sounds like you don't agree. Well, either way, someday, maybe when you're like 75, you'll, you'll believe me. Anyway, I'm not going to stop doing it. I'm not going to stop giving equation sheets. I'm still going to give equation sheets, just to be clear. Uh, I can't, I can't change the world. Like I can't, everybody's doing it, right? So if I'm the one teacher that's not doing it, it's going to be kind of weird. I know Dr. Hacking doesn't give equation sheets. He's very old school. I respect that. And his students tend to be really strong. So, you know, <laughs> make what you will out of that. Uh, seems to work for him. All right, so let's get started. Uh, hopefully, the, the, one other thing I want to say about the exam is that like this is the first test. It may be the first exam you're taking in a while on campus, you know, but you've probably taken quite a few online exams uh, in your time of uh, the pandemic. So just keep in mind that it, it, it is going to feel a little harder than normal. You're going to be a little more stressed out than normal, a little more anxious than normal, but just remember that that's okay. It's totally okay to get a little stressed out, feel a little anxious. It's normal. Just accept that that happens and try to fight through it. You know, try to uh, uh, do your best to remain ca as calm as possible so you can so you can solve the problems. I promise you that the stuff you see on the test is not going to be it's not going to be significantly different from what you've seen before. You should be able to solve all the problems. Um, I'm going to try to make it probably a little easier than I normally would because I'm aware that, um, you know, I'm aware that it's going to be a, a serious struggle, and then uh, I assume by the by the second exam you'll feel a lot more comfortable and uh, and yeah. So with this one, just try to do your best, and it shouldn't be too bad. We haven't studied that much stuff, and I don't I don't really think that this section of physics one B is super hard. I think the hard stuff is is yet to come. Really. How is the setup going to be now that everyone in class is going on campus the same day, or are we still going to be spaced out? Yeah, you're, there's going to be two rooms, Richard. You're going to be in, it's like 108 and 109, I think. I don't think anybody has has class during our class. Like, nobody else is on campus from the physics department during that time. So, um, yeah, room 108 and 109. And there'll be a proctor in one of the rooms. Um, another physics student actually and he'll be uh, watching you and I'll just have you know I'm gonna have what you all like take your phones and backpacks put them on the side of the room and then you're gonna be really spread out so it's actually very difficult to even see your neighbor's paper <laughs> so uh, I think it's kind of nice honestly it feels like uh, maybe this is the way we should have been doing things having everybody really spaced out I think it's uh, it's kind of nice there's only 15 people in the room and stuff so okay I'm waiting for money miles to finish typing as he's typing some Um, yeah, I record everything. They're on the, they're on my YouTube page, uh, which is linked to uh, several different places on Canvas. You can also just search for Zeke Murdoch and you'll find it on YouTube. You can probably search for Murdoch Physics and I bet it would show up too, Money Miles, but, oh, he can't hear me. He can't hear me. Thanks, Troy. Appreciate it. He, if he can't hear anything, though, he needs to just restart Discord. Typing on the second monitor is really weird because there's like a delay. I wonder 
Does anyone else have this problem from time to time that they just can't hear me? Like, they can see the stream and stuff, but they just can't hear me? It's the audio thing, probably. And you, you have to, like... I, 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 you can't hear me, there's no point, but, like, it's... You need to... I don't know what he's using. Yeah, uh, make sure my volume's not zero percent. I had this meeting this week, last week I guess, with um, the physics club and one of the other, like the other advisor, Dr. Sullivan. She couldn't hear me at all, which is really strange. So, uh, yeah, okay. He needs to go into sound settings and he has to like make sure his sound device is like actually being used. And stuff doesn't really matter. I'm not going to sit here and uh, waste time with that. Let's get right into this then. I think we've covered uh, most of the questions people have about exam. If you do have more questions, just like save them for later and we'll ask them, ask them then. Okay, I wanted to do one calorimetry problem, like I said, just to review what we discussed last week. Um, just to remind you what we did last week, um, we learned about specific heat, which is where we can use this equation right here. Specific heat is a measurement of how quickly the temperature of an object changes based on the amount of energy that's put into it. And so you can quantify exactly how much heat um, enters a system by using this, uh, this calculation right here. All you need to know is the mass, the specific heat, which you look up in the table, and the temperature change. Vice versa, if you know how much energy is put into the system, you can find the temperature change that you would expect. Um, yeah, so it's a way to take temperature and turn it into energy or at least to have a way of relating temperature changes to energy, which is really powerful because we already have a lot of things that we can use energy for, and this is just gonna be another one of them. So that's a, it's a pretty powerful idea. Uh, we also learned about the concept of latent heat, and latent heat uh, looks like this. You take the mass of the object and you multiply by the latent heat of either vaporization or melting or sublimation or combustion. There's all kinds of different ones. Usually in this class, we just talk about melting and vaporizing. And um, this one is another thing where you can, you can get energy um, associated with that phase change because the idea is that if you have water that is in a state of ice and water, which I do here, I guess. In my cup, I have ice and water. And uh, so the temperature of this, because it's ice and water together, is supposed to be zero degrees. It should be really, really close to zero degrees Celsius, right? Um, and it will stay at zero degrees Celsius as long as there's still ice in there. And then once all the ice is melted, then the temperature can rise up to one degree Celsius, two degrees Celsius, and so on and so forth. But as long as you have ice and water mixed together, the total uh, temperature is going to be the freezing point of uh, water, right? And that's the idea of um, latent heat. There's energy obviously going in to melt the ice, but the ice isn't actually melting. Um, to do this, I realize now I'm going to need another uh, table that I did not copy over. My bad. But we can grab it from here if I can find it. So that's the specific heat table. We need the latent heat table. It's right there. I know you guys can't see any of this stuff. Um, but uh, yeah. Oh, wait. I need to leave that there. Alright, we're going to need this table too. Need so many tables for this stuff. I think what we'll do is we'll start solving the problem, and I'll push the tables off to the side after we've gotten the information that we need. All right, let's look at this problem here. This is from your textbook, right? It's uh, chapter 17. Uh, it's just a homework problem. There's three dots on here, which means it's one of the harder ones. So I figured that'd be a good way to review this topic. So we have a copper calorimeter can with a mass of 0.446 kilograms. It contains 0 0.095 kg of ice. So let's draw that. So we've got a can. So calorimetry means that it's probably closed off. And inside of it, we have ice cubes, 0 0.095 um, kilogram of ice. So we've got some ice down here. And we know that the initial mass of the ice is 0 0.095. And we know the mass of the copper 
we'll just call it MCU for copper, is 0.446. I'm pretty commonly going to be using um, like periodic table notation for elements and stuff like that. So if you haven't taken chemistry and you're not familiar with it, you might want to start getting kind of familiar with the periodic table and what the the elements are listed as. Not to mention that there's quite a bit of stuff we do in this class that uses the periodic table. Um, and I suspect even if you haven't taken chemistry, you've probably used the periodic table from time to time to do different things. So something you need to get comfortable with, just as a side note. Okay, so the system is initially at zero degrees Celsius. So both of these things have an initial temperature of zero degrees Celsius. That is to say the can, the copper calorimeter can, and the ice. Okay, part A says, if 0 0.0350 kilograms of steam at 100 degrees Celsius and one atmosphere of pressure is added to the can, I don't know why they tell you this part. I guess that matters. Um, yeah, it, it matters. Uh, is added to the can. What is the final temperature of the calorimeter can and its contents? At that final temperature, how many kilograms are there of ice, how many of liquid water, and how many of steam? All right, that's what we want to figure out. So we add to the system steam in some way, so we, we blow steam in here, and how much steam is it? 0.035, so the mass, I'll use S for steam, is 0.035 kg, and this has an initial temperature, we'll call this T initial for the steam. And this is equal to 100 degrees Celsius. So we want to figure out what is the final temperature of the system. So all of this goes down to one final temperature, and that's what we want to find. How should we approach this problem? What do you all think? What are, uh, now we're going to do some kind of sum of heat transfers, that's right Christian? What are, um, now one thing I will say is that there could possibly be more heat transfers than that, right Christian? Because you could also have the heat transfer associated with, um, the phase changes, right? So in principle, I think there's there's five heat transfers that we can at least that we can write down. There could be more. Um, so how do we? How do you? What do you all think? How do you get started with this problem? Like, what do you what do you need to be thinking about to kind of get down to that final temperature? What are the what are the initial things you want to think about? While you're all thinking about that, let's write down this information. So we're going to need specific heat of copper, 390. The ice will definitely change to water, the steam will definitely change to water. Okay, so now you're thinking about the right thing. Yeah, exactly. What kind of phase change do we expect here? Um, do we think the entire system is going to be all water. So I'm going to give you three options here. Uh, are we going to have a combination of steam plus water? Oops. Or all water. When I say water, I just mean liquid water. I think that's what... Oh, am I writing in a place where you can't see? No, it's kind of okay. And the third option would be um, ice plus water. What do you all think is going to happen? What is the most likely? What do you think? One, two, or three. You can put your answer in the chat. What do you think is the most likely? Steam plus water, all water, ice plus water. 
Wapatoos. If you don't know, just take a guess. I don't know. I, I have no idea. I mean, it has to be one of them, though. Would you all agree? We can't have steam, ice, and water all together unless the pressure is specifically, like, very, is, is a very specific amount. Okay, so everybody seems to think it's all going to be water, right? Okay. So let's go with that assumption. All right, now, I will say that if we start with this assumption and it's wrong, that's okay. We just have to redo the problem, and we'll know which way to go here. Something, something will happen in our calculation that won't make any sense. And we'll be like, okay, well, it has to be ice plus water, or it has to be steam plus water, basically. Okay. All right. So if it's all water, the pieces of information that we're going to need are the specific heat of copper. We're also going to need the latent heat of um, vaporization and the latent heat of fusion for water, as it's the only thing that's going to be changing its state. So if we come to this, all right, let's push this off to the side now. If we come to the heats of fusion and vaporization. We look at water, 3, 3, 4 times 10 to the 3 is the latent heat of fusion, and that's in joules per kilogram. And for the latent heat of vaporization, it's 2.256 times 10 to the 6th joules per kilogram, and of course these are things we get off of this table. Now as we've used those, I'm going to push them off to the side so we can use the rest of this room here to actually solve the problem. Wait, not, not much room left after, uh, after writing all that stuff. Make a little bit more room, I guess we move things around. Alright, so we think it's going to be all water. Let's put this up here. Just give us some room to write some equations and stuff. Okay, we know we're trying to find final temperature. Alright, that should be enough room to work with. So, let's write down all the possible heat transfers we have, as uh, I think it was Christian mentioned. There's going to be a heat transfer for uh, the copper. Um, there's going to be a heat transfer for the ice. Wait. It's already ice, right? And we think it's all going to melt, right? So I think that I'm just going to say that we have a heat transfer for the ice to, to turn into water, for the ice to melt. There's also going to be a heat transfer for the steam to condense and turn into uh, water. Plus, once we have all that water, there's going to be a heat transfer for the, the water that comes out of this. Now, the thing is that some of that water is going to be at uh, 0 degrees Celsius, and some of that water is going to be at um, 100 degrees Celsius. So I think we need two because we're going to have to do the heat transfer for the, we'll call it the steam water. And we have to do a heat transfer for the ice water as well. I never know the most clear way to write these things down. So I'll just review what I just said. We have heat is going to be going into the copper, right? Um, mainly from the steam. And it starts at zero, so the copper is going to have to heat up. Uh, the ice has to melt. That's one of these. It's the latent heat of, we'll have to use latent heat of fusion. The steam has to turn into water, but then the steam water, which starts off at 100 degrees Celsius, is going to cool down. That's this one. And the ice water, which starts off at 0 degrees Celsius, is going to heat up. That's the last one. Okay? So those are all of our heat transfers. And we want to... It's just a little bit smaller, so I can scoot this over. Um, so we want to basically go through and, and plug in all the information for these. So that's going to look like this. We're going to have for the copper, the mass of the copper, specific heat of copper, and then delta T for copper. This is where I'm going to put in numbers. Um, I'm going to call the final temperature just to be T, OK? So the common final temperature is going to be T, and we're going to put that minus T initial for the, for the copper. The copper started off with an initial temperature of 0. 
For the ice melt, this is going to be whatever the mass of the ice is, multiplied by the latent heat of fusion for water, plus for the steam, it's going to be the mass of steam um, times the latent heat of vaporization for steam. And I think that, isn't this one gonna be negative? I hope I'm not throwing you astray here, but this one's negative, right? Because the heat is being transferred. Um... You all remind me, do I put a positive sign or a negative sign there? Gas is losing heat. Is everyone okay with that, that negative sign? It's like, I always think about it as if it's going from a phase change where it's uh, solid to liquid or liquid to gas, that's that's positive. But if it's going the other direction, like from steam to water, yeah. Okay, so everyone seems to agree, that's good. Um, the next uh, part is the steam water. So what I meant by this was, if I take the mass of the steam and I multiply that by um, the specific heat of water now, CW is going to be for water. And then I multiply by its temperature change, which is going to go down to the same final temperature, but it's going to start off at 100 degrees Celsius. And then finally, the same kind of expression for the ice water. Almost had enough room to write this here. For the ice water, we're also going to have a term that's going to be M ice, C ice. And then final temperature of the system minus its initial temperature, which for the water was zero degrees Celsius. Well, not the water, but the, the ice. Oh, I made a mistake. It's not specific heat of ice here. It's, the, it's now in liquid water form. So this should be a specific heat of water. If you don't do that, you'll make a mistake. So we got that big long equation. Good thing is that there's only one unknown. Everything in this equation is something that we know except for T. Bad thing is we have to solve for T. However, there are some terms that are zero, like this one and this one. Um, but uh, that's pretty much it. Before we, I mean, that's, in my mind, this is the solution, right? If, if, assuming we get it right, everything, what we've written here is basically the solution. We're gonna do some algebra and stuff, but does anyone have any questions? So many subscripts. I know that can be very confusing. Hopefully I use them in a way that's that's clear to you. W stands for water. Okay, if you don't have any questions, let's um I I, I don't I hate doing the algebra on these things because I think it just takes up a lot of time. So I'm just gonna write down what I believe the solution is gonna be. Um, and you all can tell me if it makes or doesn't make sense. So work out for yourself, try to solve the this this for t, and uh, you know, tell me if you get the same thing. I would like for somebody else to answer that question because I want to see if you all have actually been paying attention. What do you, what do you, what is, what does someone else think the answer to Umair's question is? Or Umair, what do you think the answer to your question is? Which, which one of those do we do in this physics class? Do we plug a bunch of numbers in and then start solving or do we solve for T first and then plug the numbers in? How do we do it? Yeah, solve for T. I don't know if you know this, Umair, but I have to grade the exams, and that means I have to be able to follow your work. 
and it is extremely hard, extremely hard to sol to follow people's work when they just plug a bunch of numbers in. It usually ends up resulting in way less points than they would have gotten if they just didn't even plug the numbers in at all. In fact, I'll, I'll, I'll give you one little tip here too, right, right after I finish writing this down about how, I, how you can save time on the test. Okay, I think that's gonna be the numerator because we're gonna basically take the MICE LF and subtract it over to the left-hand side. That's that term right there. We're gonna add M steam LV. We're gonna add it over to the right-hand side. And then the only other term that doesn't have a T in it is M steam CW times 100, so it's a negative. So we add that to the right-hand side. I believe that's all the stuff that shows up in the numerator and then all the factors of T will be in the denominator. So we'll have MCU, CCU, um, plus M steam, 